Yeah. I don't know if my approach is good. I, I don't trust anyone. I just focus on being okay. Yeah. So I'm the opposite. I trust everybody <laughs> just, intrinsically. How do you navigate that mind map of like, hey, this person's important or this is someone I really want to talk to? How do I not start treating them above me and try and see as more of an equal. The more you meet people, you, you realise they're just people, right? same, same as everyone else, right? And you're only probably, most people are two different incidents away from being homeless, and so. Uh, my name's Richard Conway. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Pure SEO, which is New Zealand's largest search engine optimization. You're successful, I think. Maybe you not you could not be profitable because you got so many staff. But like, what what would you remove your humility? Yeah, we've been successful. Like we've been profitable since day one, pretty much. Optimization is a process of getting a website to rank higher on Google. So off here, we were talking about introversion. And I think, like I was saying, that a lot of people sort of see the end. Yeah, you know, they see where we're at now, and they don't see the journey. So, when you say introverted, what, what, when when are you shitting yourself? When are you like fucking wait, what, quaking in your boots? What's your worst scenario? So I came to New Zealand in two thousand nine. My wife's English as well. We didn't know anyone in this country, and um, wanted to start a business. I thought, how do you start a business? And um, you got to meet people, and I'm. Yeah, like I say, like you say, an introvert. And so I was rocking up to events full of people and standing in the corner, not knowing anyone. And think, All right, yeah, got to kind of get over it. And so what I did was first I started to identify other people like me who are standing by themselves. You talk to them, and they're like, really keen to talk to you. And then it's probably not politically correct, but um, <laughs> I started looking for the best looking female in the room. And you start, you talk to them. You know, it's just as hard to talk to them as anyone else. Um, and then everyone wants to join you and talk to you and people remember you for doing that. And so you bring other people in um, and then all of a sudden, the more times you do that, the more people know you and it becomes easier. Ha, not politically correct. Good, you're in safe hands. Because <laughs> um, uh, there, there's this concept of social momentum. So you incrementally express yourself in these venues. Like you start yeah. with high eye contact and it builds and it builds. Yeah. Um, and whether it's the attractive girl in the club or if it's a very successful person you want to talk to, we have a tendency of pedestaling it. Yeah. Pedestaling them. Yeah, yeah. It's not a great start. No, it's true though. So how do you how do you navigate that mind map of like, hey, this person's important or this is someone I really want to talk to? How do I not start treating them above me and try and see as more of an equal? So um, with a good looking women at um, events I'm a married man uh, there's no so there's no stress I'm not going to try and chat them <laughs> yeah. up or something so that removes a lot of the you know pedestaling because there's no hidden agenda um, but you know, I've, I've met quite a lot of uh, reasonably famous people and I got to spend a week with Richard Branson on Necker Island and the more you meet people you, you realize they're just people right same same as everyone else right and you're only probably most people are two different incidents away from being homeless and so um, in my experience, I reckon uh, I don't really hear I worship people or put people on pedestal because just people, aren't we? You know, I don't think I'm any better than secretary or, or anything. Like we're just people, and I find if you reach out to people, it doesn't matter how famous they are or how. Quite often, they'll give you their time because people are intrinsically quite good. Um, and a case in point, um, I wrote a book for Penguin Random House a few years ago around SEO. And I reached out to this guy called Ram Fishkin, who's like the most well-known person in our industry. And he ended up writing a chapter up for the book. I've never met the guy in person, but, you know, it's often our own self-limiting beliefs that stop us sort of engaging with people like that. Um, but they are just people. And, you know, they've been where you are, most likely. And so um, I think you've got to kind of get over that self-doubt and just do it. Yeah, well, just to help people get a bit of context, because I made the mistake of just talking like, "Who the fuck's this person?" And like, if you go on your website and you look at team and you keep, I was like, "Who's Amanda? I want to know who Amanda is, so I can, you know, treat her like a human being when she comes in." Yeah. So I was scrolling, and I kept scrolling. And speaking of Amanda, yeah, yeah. Amanda can come in. How did you know? Yeah, <laughs> just had an aura. This is part of the podcast. You're a bit psychedelic there. Yeah. <laughs>
So she. So she yes, she's here. Should I nab the other chair that's out in the foyer and um, bring? Oh, you've got one here. One chair in the corner. Right. Yeah. One moment, please. Can we do this? Yeah, yeah keep going. Ah, uh, keep going. This is great content. The. <laughs> yeah. So. You're successful, I think. Maybe you're not. You could not be profitable because you got so many staff. But like, what? What would you remove your humility? Yeah. And be like, you know, what? Are you successful, or what does it look like, or you know, as Amanda walks in? Hello, welcome. You can talk. You can just grab a seat. This is Amanda. Amanda. You're in the concept for a split second. Cool. Yeah, we've been successful. Like we've been profitable since day one, pretty much. Um, and I, I've actually reflected because we we we've got quite a number of people, and I reflect reasonably regularly on, on what's happened because I remember sitting down there with um, it being just me on the corner of somebody's desk and now I sit we've got our office building with people milling around and you think you've got to pinch yourself you, you know you kind of wouldn't really expect um, to be there and, and I reflected and I think the one thing that's separated us from the other agencies and why we've grown bigger um, is we genuinely give a shit like we really do if if someone if a customer um, is not having a good experience we want to fix that you know, we're not going to take shortcuts and we're going to put our hand up if something goes wrong and you know, it's my reputation I've got um, people that invested in the business it's also their reputation and I think it really comes down to actually caring and, and putting people people put their trust in you and then paying back that trust and I think that's kind of core to our success don't take shortcuts do what you say you're going to do phone people back um, and just really care you know it's not that complicated yeah and just to acknowledge amanda hello (laughs) you're welcome to make as much noise as you need take as many photos as you want um yeah yeah no you're right you're right so i just thought if i was coming in and you'd be nervous and you know i'd I'd be like this trying not to make any noise i just don't want you to feel like that so on that i was there was a guest before um that came on the show, Alex Redford. And we were talking as we were walking up the stairs and the elevator's broken. It looks ominous, as ominous can be. What? Are, oh, we got coffee too from Amanda. Herbal tea. <laughs> Herbal tea. Green tea. With it's milk. all happening. Um, so w- there's an interesting revelation around AI and a lot of your business is centered around, you know, optimizing search so you appear in a good place where people yeah. can buy. And now people aren't necessarily going through search. They're going through, you know, a plug-in with ChatGBT or Google's got this new thing over the last few days. So partly when you found this out, did you start shitting yourself? And you're like, what the hell am I going to do? Were you excited? You already expected it? Like what? So like my, my favorite quote is that um, pessimists find the problem in every opportunity and optimists find the opportunity in every problem, right? And I see this as a fundamental shift in everything. And we can either become a blockbuster video and become redundant, or we see the opportunity, and that's exciting. You know, as an entrepreneur, the opportunities and the shiny lights and the uh, things are what kind of excites you and reinvigorates you. So um, I see AI as a massive opportunity. It's a huge threat to our industry, but it's also a massive opportunity because people are always going to want to advertise, and they're always want to get in front of their customers, and they're always want to get an ROI, and that's what we're going to do for them. Is it going to be the same as it was is today in two years? No, absolutely not. Um, but what I was, I was saying to you on the way in um, is we're embracing this. So I reached out to that Ram Fishkin guy that I was talking about earlier and asked him who's the best in the world in AI, machine learning, large language models and digital marketing. And we found this lady um, in or introduced this lady in New York. And so we've contracted her for six months to come in and look at um, our internal processes and what we offer clients because you don't know what you don't know. So I I believe in bringing in the best of the best to ensure that our clients are getting the best of the best. It's costing me a fortune, but the end result is we've got, you know, seven, 800 companies that trust us to do their marketing for them. And so we've got to do right by them. And, you know, I saw when I came here how many agencies just take shortcuts. They used automated tools for link building and stuff. And that was always you're going to come unstuck it's going to be the same people using chat gpt and jasper or whatever it is just to create content and just throw it out there and then that's a race to the bottom how do you make the difference and the difference is 
the magic using the EQ and just the anecdotes and the, the special stuff that AI doesn't necessarily have the ability um, to create. And you know, my belief is life is about the experiences you have and the people you meet. And so if you can kind of weave that into your content with storytelling, then that's what's going to resonate. Um, and I don't believe AI can do that authentically. And I think people you know, can feel authenticity. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I was, um, you hear of all these people that found this latest hack and, you know, we can get these 20, 30 plus local SEO registries and we can put you on page one yeah. on Google. And I hear of people like Mr. B saying everyone's focusing on the algorithm instead of the audience. And I see any sort of transformation or new technology is just a move towards a human interaction. Yeah. Like it becomes more real at each stage. Yeah. So and cutting corners, you know, in life, same thing with financial advisory. Yeah. You know, you can't instant, you know, get rich quick sort of things don't yeah. seem to work. So you said something interesting there as well. Though, was hiring someone that's knowledgeable, but you didn't replace your team. You developed your team. So mm. what are your thoughts on that? Because I see a lot of people they hire these incredible managers supposedly that have no rapport, no understanding, and then it just closes off the progression of any team member. Yeah. So what what is your take on developing your team and outsourcing and yeah are you are you hire the the fancy manager to take over or what's your So um just on a side Mr Beast is awesome I don't know if you've listened to like he did a podcast with Joe Rogan and there's so many so many nuggets of gold in there you know it's a young kids 25 or something and like it's absolute genius and a lot of that stuff is kind of transferable um and I only found out about him because of my 12 year old <laughs> kid you know it's a billion dollar company uh, it's probably yeah, a different generation but i believe that you need to hire people with eq um and the ability to relate to others you know it's a bit of a cliche but a non-dick policy um i think that people come to work for you because they choose to come to work for you and you want to make the environment as nice as possible um, i also believe what you ignore you accept Right. So if someone does something that is not on brand or is not in the culture, you've got to um, call it out and you've got to empower other people to call it out as well. Um, but on the other side, you need the technical capability. And so there, there's a mix, but I'd much rather have the people with uh, um, personal ability, personal skills than the technical skills because you can learn technical skills. Um, but I want people to come and be treated right by other people within the business. Um, like I was saying earlier, I don't think anyone is better than anyone else. And so why should someone, because they're a manager, treat someone any differently? They shouldn't. They should nurture. They should support. Uh, but a little bit different to that, I also believe that you know, most most people think you should spend your most time on your weakest um, employees, etc., to bring them up. I, I kind of look at it the other way around because think about a sports team um, a manager will work on your best players um, and improve them and then if you're not doing that you're they're actually being penalized for being best um, and so I kind of want to keep improving the bar and getting better and better people um, and you learn no one's irreplaceable as well you know so uh, I learned that quite early on yeah yeah or do you have a story on that? Is that a frantically push a button while multitasking? Do you yeah. have a story? What, what are your lessons? Because I sense wisdom through experience coming uh, from your end. A bit of an emotional experience. So like 2012, um, what, maybe five or six staff, maybe 10 staff, something like that. And my wife got cancer um, in August. And in the same week that she got diagnosed, my most important staff member, the guy who actually knew what he was doing, handed in his notice to go uh, to a competitor and he was like the the one that really knew what he was doing. And it was, yeah, it's one of those times when you, you wake up in the morning, you don't want to get out of bed. You don't want to face people. But then you've got staff that rely on you. You've got customers that rely on you. And, and so you, you do. And that's often the difference between success and failure. But every time we've lost a critical member of staff, um, we've somehow managed to find another person or another uh, process that's actually taken us up a gear and... Um, and so over the years, I've learned it may feel really painful at the time, uh, but in the long run, it, it tends to be beneficial for the business. Um, yeah. So do you, I often find like, so the furthest I got was a team of 15 and you can just talk to them. But then when yep. you get beyond that, it gets a little interesting. What, what has been your learnings at, at each stage? Because on one hand, if you just sell, 
and even if your product's not amazing, you can keep it going. But then it becomes a product important component, yeah. and then it becomes a people component, and then it becomes how to as a system support these people when I'm not there to instill the values that I want. So how are you navigating that piece where I feel like you're in that zone now? So there's been three inflection points or 10 to 15 people um, when profitability kind of erodes um, because you need systems and processes and you need people to get to that next stage. Um, And that's a hard stage. Um, But if you can work out how to get through it and it's generally product and system led, then you're right. Then you get sort of 25, 30 people. And that's, again, another thing where the people who were really good in the early days are not necessarily the right people for an organization that starts to have layers and starts to have more intricate processes. And then there was like 50 to 60 people where um, things got a little bit less personal. You know, it's always been you know, like led from very entrepreneurial perspective and you know everyone and you chat to everyone 50 60 people it starts to become a bit less personal and you you have again more layers and that's another hard um stage to get through and so that and they seem to be the same in in lots of other businesses you know you get to these stages these inflection points and you've got to work out how to get past you often sort of like grow and then you flatline and you've got to how do we grow again or go down a little bit and how do we grow again it's never a linear path uh, but if it was a linear path, it'd be easy and everyone would do it, wouldn't they? Yeah, true. So on that layer component, you know, we we used to talk about dead branches and even though they're exceptional performers, they're bringing the culture down. And making those tough calls isn't easy, but I always look at it like, you know, you can be nice or you can be kind and mm. being kind isn't always nice. Yeah. So how do you develop that second layer where... Is that where you live, your your greatest leverage activity is? Like, where do you put your focus now at your stage and you recognize if you can focus on that, it's the best for the business? So we all have our skill sets, right? And recognizing where you're good and where you're not is, is really important to growing a business. And I think one of the differences for successful entrepreneurs and, and non-successful is the ability to delegate and find people who are good at the stuff that you're not good at. Um, and so... I'm, I've now kind of removed myself almost totally from the operational side of the business. I'm not really involved day to day. Um, at the moment, I've moved myself uh, more to marketing with Amanda and more to strategy and sort of brand building because that's kind of what I love. I love meeting people, hearing stories, and you know, people buy from people, and so you create relationships, and that's accretive over over time. Um, you get more and more business because you create relationships and you become trusted and you do your best in in every um, scenario and then people remember that um, and recognize that but the more layers you have um, the harder it is to be over everything so you need people around you you can trust implicitly and I've got um, two people um, who are um, run the business for want of a better term um, on a day-to-day basis and I trust them implicitly one's really focused on the sales side of things and one's really focused on the business improvement operational side of things um, but funnily enough I bought the sales guy in um, we spent a year one of these inflection points where um, we were bringing in these sales people and they were failing they weren't bringing in the business and um, I kept thinking of bringing crappy sales people but it turned out when I brought in this guy, Kyle, um, he put in the systems and processes and it wasn't actually the salespeople. They just weren't given the right tools to succeed. And all of a sudden the salespeople started to succeed. And it's not because we had different people. It's because they were given the right tools to be successful in the role. And you, know, you don't know what you don't know. And then you bring people in and you let them do their thing. And they'll, you know, they'll do things that you don't even think about. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, bridge the gaps. It's insane, eh? Like, I mean, so that's, I used to work for AppCard, if you've ever heard of them. Um, they're like the largest face-to-face marketing company no one's heard of because they sell everyone else's products. Yeah. And it's crazy. You have someone that knows nothing, no sales tactics, no experience, but they, they're interested in people and they're passionate about what they're selling. So do you, do you ever think of that in the sales component is instead of, you know, here's the pitch, here's the structure, is there a process where you, lack of a better word, indoctrinate them in the belief of what you're doing? And you're not saying, hey, our products break. You're actually saying, hey, when our product's fucked, we do everything we can to fix it. Do you do something like that in the sales well, side? Yeah, well, the there's a few sides to that. So one, um, 
I always want us to be the best in our core product. And I, I want to be able to go out and say, hand on heart, there's no one better in New Zealand than us. Um, and then that, if you believe that, then the salespeople believe that. And I want them to to believe in a product they're selling because if they don't believe in it, they're not going to be able to sell it. Um, the other side of that is um, Kyle, the, so the, the guy who runs them, will not sign off a deal if we don't think we can provide value to the customer. And um, also... Um, they know that if something goes wrong, we will lose money to make it right. You know, they know that. They know that if it if something doesn't work or whatever, it's not them that's gonna um you know, pay for it. If we've done something wrong, we'll put our hands up and we'll deal with it and we'll front foot it and we'll do the right thing. You know, it's one of our um core sort of values is doing the right thing. And um, the more you do that the more empowered people are to do that and I say to the team like if something you did was on the front page of the Herald would you be alright with it um, and if they say no I say simply don't do it you know simple as yeah, same with like yeah, in your gut you know the right and wrong thing to do um, and so don't do the wrong thing and I was just in a meeting with someone else and I was telling him April 2020 we were 400k down on monthly recurring revenue from customers who um, didn't know if they could pay their staff and they phone us up and say look you know we don't know if we can pay our staff we were in a contract with you guys but you know what can you do and so we said you know we'll let you pause because you've got to do the right thing can't turn around and say fuck you pay me yeah because it's just not the right thing to do um, and I think if you do the right thing then that comes back in the future um, but I also sat down with my wife you know 400k down in the month you know we weren't making that profit and um, you know she said you know if it all goes wrong tomorrow is it the end of the world? Probably not. Start something again. And if you look back and say, achieve this in this length of time, would you change anything? No. So, um, you know, what will be will be. Um, as long as you can, you know, hand on heart, say you've always done the right thing by your customers and you haven't taken shortcuts and you haven't risked their brand. Yeah, it's not always going to work out. But people understand generally if you do the right thing. Yeah, there's... um. There's an interesting quote from Epictetus. It's like, man doesn't suffer by a crisis, but by his interpretation of it. Mm. So it's an interesting shift in, in how your wife contributed that mindset and that yeah. belief around it. And a lot of entrepreneurs I see uh, have yet to smoothly go through life and have to navigate stress. <laughs> and it sounds like you've got a good support network in that component. But w what's your, I guess, framework for handling the chaos? So um, kickboxing, so probably do that three or four times a week. We pay for um, anyone at Pure. We've got private class on a Monday, um, kickboxing, uh, massages, um, holidays. Um, and then I, I'm a member of Entrepreneurs' Organization. So we've mm. got like a, I don't know if you've ever read uh, Napoleon Hill, I've like got a mastermind mm. team. And you've got, like it's, been, it's quite lonely being an entrepreneur because you kind of, you don't make friends with um, people within the company. You... You, you are kind of separate and isolated. And so having fellow entrepreneurs who have got the same problems as you is, in my view, like game changing for an entrepreneur. And a lot of our mates as a family, young kids, um, skin, they're not interested in business. And um, and so you're not comfortable talking about that stuff. And, and so having that EO network, you know, I've got people I can just be myself with. And I've got none of the friends I grew up with because they're all in the UK. And so having that, network here has been for me absolute game changer yeah i don't think i've ever achieved anything in life without the idea of someone else yeah like creativity is just a thousand pieces of other people's ideas through the filter of your existence you know yeah well that's why i love books as well like because oh, yeah. you can you can dip into people's experiences and learn from them like the bit the most successful people in the world yeah you know? and it's just it's there for you for the taking their experience is being given to you if you choose to uh, um take it on so i read probably for an hour every single night like, wow. um i love reading it's one of my active relaxations so yeah i hate it but i know i need to so i, I talk to people like you or um <laughs> or audiobooks or summaries yeah. so what what on the book thing cuz everyone loves that mm. so you know you've achieved this level of success what 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 would you either a tiered list of books at stages of business or just your all-time most important books in your life it it just depends like um 
you can take little bits from different things like losing my virginity the Richard Branson one was quite um, influential to me think and grow rich um, I like shoe dog recently which is the um, Nike story I even found the I can't remember what it's called but the Theranos uh, book recently for the lady who created that company got all these investors oh the blood company yeah um, and it was all built on a lie it's like <laughs> fascinating and then also you look at TV programs I think there was We Crashed um, which is the WeWork story, Son Newman, and then there was the other one with the guys um, who created Uber. Um, and you learn so much from these, and a lot of it is about having uh, chutzpah, having balls, and just like going and saying, look, I'm just going to um, have a go and you know, jazz hands and you know, all that kind of thing. You know, it's... Yes. it's yeah, yeah, like shiny look at me, you know, yeah, 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 that kind of stuff. But yeah. it works, you know, and it's all. And um, there is a book I don't know what it's called, but there's seven types of story that intrinsically resonate with people. So rags to riches, um, that David and Goliath, uh, um, your triumph against adversity, and that kind of stuff. And if you put your narrative with one of those stories in mind, mm. then people can't help but resonate with it. That being said, there always has to be authenticity and realism and, and truth behind the story. It can't be I'm making this up because it uh, fits that narrative because uh, people can feel that, I think. Yes. Yeah, they notice. I think I think that's the whole game is how do you authentically represent an emotional theme that others experience? So I think about that always when I'm interviewing people on the podcast. I, was, I went all... Speaking of Mr. Beast, he said, um, a good, if you want to know how to do a good story, study Pixar. Me being lazy, I was like, AI, tell me to, how to spell this. <laughs> and then it told me oh, emotional things. And it was like a uh, toy story, like feeling forgotten. Yeah. So the toy being abandoned. Or it might be, you know, not feeling good enough or not worthy. So when I'm talking to like a podcast guest or if I'm making content for someone, I'm like, is there a story in their life that will resonate with an emotional thing that others experience? Because I, I think that's challenging where you see this pinnacle of success and this person that's reached a certain standard in life that it, it seems out of reach. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, we're all kind of built with different skill sets, aren't we? And some, some skill sets are good for making money and building businesses, where other skill sets are good for create, creative things. And um, the world is a little bit, Topsy turvy. You think like one of the most important jobs in the world has to be teachers because you know that's the next generation. Yet they're paid a fraction of like a CEO for a company that does advertising, for example. You know, which it it is back to front. Um, but ultimately, you got to lean on your own um, strengths. And if you lean on your own strengths and you you dive into that, then you're more likely to be successful. And something I learned uh, years ago when I was at university is I think it was the, the Japanese principle of Kaizen. It's like continual improvement. You do something every day to improve You know, nothing happens overnight. It, it's these little steps that create the big things. Um, and I, I don't think, you know, there's certainly nothing special about me. I'm not that smart, but I love business. And if you're obsessed with something and you're passionate about something, then you're likely to be good at it. Yeah. You know? And so it's not, I don't think, you know, I don't think you've got to be that smart to be an entrepreneur. Um, I think you, I think almost a bit the other way because you want <laughs> smart people around you who you can yeah. delegate to, who can do the magic. It's quite, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm going to be rude while consciously uh, listening. I was just looking at the time to hit your two and hit Sweet. my two because so we've both got meetings. Uh, we're, we're at um, 1.25, just this why. So we'll, we'll, we'll go for the 1.45 so you got time to get to the meeting. Sweet. Yeah. Um, there, there's an interesting thing around the educational component there because a lot of the most successful entrepreneurs I've seen aren't suited for school yep. and are taught they're not worth something. Yep. What was like your first moment either shedding away from the old narrative of like, you know, get a career, you know, yeah. go to university or whatever? And was school good to you? So um, I had a bit of a like apathetic sort of education. I was, I went to university, um, but I, you know, in the UK, you kind of um, perceive university as something to go and get drunk and meet women and have fun, <laughs> right? So I didn't really study. I had 25% attendance, um, got a letter saying, um, are you still at university? Um, and that sort of gave me a kick in the thing. But then I did um, a placement year, third year, um, and I 
was given a job at PricewaterhouseCoopers in the UK in, in the software testing. And by the end of that, I kind of um, became a team lead due to a um, maternity um, cover. And that gave me confidence. Um, and like, I, I was never, you know, I was always I was a perennial underachiever at school, but I like the social aspect and the sports aspect and that kind of stuff. But I've got two kids, like, and one of them, she has uh, autism and ADHD. And, oh, um, double whammy. She, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she's in the top 2% like intellect. Right? So, so she's a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> yeah, right. No like, doubt. High for focus and the ability uh, to... Yeah, yeah. It's, um, <laughs> but as an adult, I think she'll be massively successful because there's nothing that'll get in her way. She'll just run through brick walls. Whereas my boy on the other side is gentle, academic, really unsporty and... You know, very different, and so I think you have the education system needs to cater to these different kind of personalities, and it's I don't think education is very good for that, and so we had to end up sending our kids to two different schools, which is a, a pain. But um, you need to give your kids the right environment for them, and and that wasn't thought of when I was a kid. You know, we just went to school, and I never did any homework or anything <laughs> like that. You know, probably a whole typical ADHD kind of thing. Uh, yeah. um, Bit of a and, free spirit, brother. <laughs> but but you do, you learn, especially at university, you learn one of the most important skills, which is that social skill, the ability to communicate with people and the ability to form relationships and think a little bit critically. So even if you're not necessarily focused on the academia side of things, um, you do, there is value to it and lots of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah I had a... I essentially didn't know what I wanted to do, so I just travel around the world living in a tent and I lived off $10 a week on food, did lots of drugs and whatever I wanted at any time. But you learn a lot from that as well. Like yeah. that, you know, ex that's lived experience and, and that also is is equally um, important because um, you learn cultures, you learn how to survive on 10 bucks a day <laughs> and, and so on and so forth. So it's, um, there is more than one way I think, and I was always, you know, my mum's uh, from the Czech Republic, she, academic, and she was always very much education, education. Um, I'm less like that. I, I kind of think education isn't for everybody. You know, it's um, for my son, definitely. My daughter, you know, if, if she decides she wants to pursue something else, like entrepreneurship, whatever it is, it might not be that she goes to university, and that's okay, you know. It is what it is. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to be obsessive about learning, but I don't think education is really that important. No. Like I could coast, go through it, didn't really care. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing I learned from that experience was how I could die tomorrow and not care because I realized doing everything you ever wanted in life doesn't actually matter. What matters is people and purpose. Yeah. Um, so what was it? What was your turning point where you're like, okay, I'm sort of having fun, meeting people, developing my social skills. And then you're like, oh, yeah, pure SEO. Just says as a child, you're like, you know what? I'm going to get good at keywords. It's, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm probably more on the entrepreneurship side than the technical side, albeit um, in, I think, 2002, um, I, I worked for a pro commercial property fund and we were buying commercial property, spending £180,000 a year advertising in the Times, the Telegraph, Independence, cash buyers, of commercial property. I set up a Google Ads campaign for them Um and we reduced the spend to £25,000 a year and got double the inquiries. I thought, hang on, there's probably something in this digital thing. <laughs> uh, but then I came to New Zealand in 2009 with Emily, my wife, and we didn't know anybody, but I thought rather arrogantly that I'd walk into a good job because I built quite a big company for someone else in England, but no one wanted to give me a job because no Kiwi experience. I've always wanted to do entrepreneurship things. We had no children. We didn't have a mortgage because we were renting there. And so there wasn't the same level of risk that a lot of people have and I've always wanted to do it. Um, the logo was designed by a guy for a uh, bottle of Grey Goose vodka. Um, <laughs> I cobbled together the website after a page. It looked like a child had done it, but it sufficed. Um, and then it was just getting out there and doing things. And um, one of the best decisions I ever made, I often think I wish I'd done it 10 years earlier. What was that outreach like? So you're cold calling, you're door knocking, you're uh, putting Google AdWords because you know how to do it. What was your strategy? meeting people networking because mm. i didn't know anyone in new zealand 
Um, so it was really just meeting people because we, we, ne- we were never going to rank, didn't have the money to spend on, on advertising. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so it was really going out. And then I remember our first customer, you'd, you'd, all, you'd practically give them a massage on the way out. You, know, you just want to over-service them because you just want to uh, prove yourself. And so um, it carries on. But I learned a lot in those early years because you, know, you don't know pretty much anything. And I remember um, I didn't get, customers sign contracts because as far as I was concerned you shake hands with someone that's a done deal and that's thing and then someone didn't pay me and disappeared and yeah, uh, yeah. that was an expensive lesson yeah 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 so, uh, now everyone signs contracts um yeah. not that I necessarily keep them to contract because you want to work with good people who want to work with you um but you know if you do the work you should get paid fair days uh, work for a fair day's pay yeah I don't know if my approach is good I, I don't trust anyone I just focus on being okay yeah because i don't know like i feel like trust is just a speculation on the future they have these characteristics they act this kind of way and in the future they'll be like this yeah do what's best for them fuck it i'll just <laughs> i'll work it out so i'm the opposite i trust everybody <laughs> intrinsically okay. um and it's bit me in the ass so many times right and to the point where um i'm not even involved in interview process i don't meet people because i like everybody and so i'm rubbish at kind <laughs> of you know sort of defining and finding the good people so I, i'm not even involved in that process i find people are much better at um, judging character than i am i just yeah i just hmm. like people well that imagine that would be very helpful in the delegation piece so like i used to compete with people in the same office which i don't think is a necessarily great strategy and yeah. sabotage them so i could win and then also um, not trust people to do it because i could do it better which i can't yeah so i've had to work on that i got yeah. better still comes through yeah. so the i imagine your approach is you know you you're instilling this belief in someone they probably live up to that expectation of belief quite often because they might not have that belief in themselves yeah um and then also you're delegating quite quickly so you're more nimble and free you can hurt as long as you you know accept and move on so what's your process for forgiveness then um well i i kind of I try not to hold on to things because it's only you that ends up eating up, right? Yeah. And so I try and um, not hold grudges. I remember, and I, you know, I won't necessarily work with people. I've been screwed over loads of times because <laughs> yeah. I intrinsically um, <laughs> do trust people. But I think I'd rather be that. And that's my default. You know, that's how I'm built. You know, I'm an optimist. Uh, I want to like people. But you do become a little bit more cynical as you get older. And I used to really care what people think about me. I, don't care anymore like i'm Mm. 45 now and i just you know you do what's true to yourself and if you um feel you've done the right thing you know people can't ask for more than that but i've learned over the years you know different people see the world in different ways and you know if you feel something doesn't mean it's true and it also doesn't mean that your way is the right way it just might be the right way for you you know i've I mentored quite a lot of people over the years and and my thing is growth that's what i love you know strategy and growth but you know some people they're just technically really good they've got to have their hands on 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 everything and you know that's going to stymie growth it's like a bottleneck but they're happy with that you know i don't understand that mentality it's not how i'm built but you know they just want to do good stuff for good people and that's totally fine it's just not you know i'm not a good mentor for someone like that because i um i want to grow i want to get bigger and you know and, and someone like that doesn't want to they want to stay niche and and get their hands dirty so uh, you learn that there's there's different ways and and one way is not necessarily right or wrong it's just different yeah i bowed up some poor guy from bbt digital i don't know if you know, I know mike very well yeah he's a yeah. good lad yeah. uh, cr- so crushed him a little bit at the end he's he had humility to ask me what i thought and i was like i think your business like soul you know the why yeah so I'm wondering, like, I have this theory that the most fulfilling thing you can do is to help a version of yourself in the world. So yeah. a problem that you've witnessed or experienced. So I'm wondering, what is the most fulfilling thing for you in life? Or what is, what's the point of pure SEO? Like, why are they here? Yeah, well, there's, there's yeah, there, there's kind of a, a multiple kind of sides for this. So um, the whole pure SEO thing, I look around them, you know, we've got, you know, between 80 and 100 employees approximately and like the fact that people rely on you for their wages I mean that's cool making a difference to people and also like I tell my story and you know we've we had quite we had three miscarriages in the first year we were here and like 
Um, I believe in being honest and candid. And if one or two people can take something away from your story and it makes a difference then, then it's, it's got to be worth it, I think, you know. And, um, and if you, you know, so many people helped me like on this journey, gave me their time for nothing or just advice and, and things. And I think it's important to do the same to other people. Um, and that's fulfilling. And, you know, I mentor a reasonable number of people and I give my time, I don't charge these people because people did that for me and I kind of, um, you know, pay it forward. Um, but I'll only work with people who um, really want to, you know, they're going to actually do what they say they're going to do. Because mm -hmm. if someone says they're going to do something and then you see them again and they haven't done it, what's the point? They're wasting your time, they're wasting their own time. Yeah, no, mm. that's fair. And while we're at 137, so, yeah, I, I think, yeah, they're so valuable. I, I got a little too anal on that one. Like if people were five minutes late, I'm like, all well, the best of life, you know what I mean? Nothing, nothing against yeah. you. <laughs> but like I'm uh, working on that. Um because I think that's so important. Like you're doing a disservice to people if you let things slide, not in a way where you're emotional about it. Like I want them to be happy. I'm just like, you know, if everyone just coasts through and lets it be okay, then what's that doing for your world? So as we uh, wrap this up to go to our um, separate meetings, because mm. it says a lot about you that you're at the stage of your life. Like essentially what happened, I cold call your organization. They put you, told you podcast. And you're like, hey, podcast, what the hell's this? And I was like, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, okay, I'll come. I think that says a lot to maintain that humility through life and also still want to help people but being aware of not wasting your time. So how do you maintain, like, I think absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. So how do you stop getting too up yourself and, you know, distant from reality and not caring about clients because you're not seeing them because that's what happens as you get further and further yeah. away? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, I think your wife and your kids like probably <laughs> keep you. you, yeah, yeah, quick to. Uh, but I've changed, right? You know, the, in the early days, you know, writing a twenty grand check would have given me a heart attack, and now I don't even think about it. You know, it's a, and so you have to ground yourself. Um, but like I said earlier, you know, it doesn't matter how successful you are; you're just a person. You're no better than anyone else, and it's it's remembering that. And when your ego brings you into stuff. It often makes your life worse. You know, you get stressed with things that you shouldn't necessarily have your hands on, right? But it's your ego bringing you in and so taking a check. And also being comfortable people calling you out and not taking offense to it. Like, I've got people around me, and if I'm being a dick and someone calls me out, like, good on them for calling me out. And, yeah, learn from it. <laughs> yeah, good at times, eh? Mm. Nah, nah, I love it too. I, I struggle with yes, man. Mm. I just, I don't believe them. Yeah. <laughs> so, what, well, okay, so now as we're as in the end now, there, there's probably someone sitting and listening to this and they're thinking, you know, like, then maybe they had the experience you had at school, you know, you weren't that fulfilled, you're doing all these different things and then business sort of happened and they're on that, that the epithet of like, I'm about to start, I'm afraid. So what would your advice be to that person? So everyone's afraid. Like, <laughs> yeah. No one knows what they're doing. Um, I think it was uh, Claudia Batten said, the Kiwi entrepreneur, like embrace vomit moments. You know, it's embrace, feel the fear and do it anyway. And it's not going to be an easy path. It's not going to be a linear path. It'll be a squiggly line. Um, there's going to be ups and downs. But, and it's also not for everyone entrepreneurship. Like, it really isn't. Um, but what have you got to lose if you give it go? You know, I'd rather regret doing something than regret not doing it. Oh, poetic. And now to do a shameless promotion from all the selling you've done over the years, who <laughs> should find you? What problem are you solving and why should they find you? Now, you want to get customers to your business. You want to go to ROI. We, we run a digital marketing agency. Don't think there's anyone even in the same ballpark as us in SEO. Uh, we'd be the largest independent Google ads. Um, but ultimately, you know, you work with us, we'll do the best that we possibly can for you. And, you know, you can't really ask for more than that. Um, but yeah, have fun while doing it. Boom, done. You've done a, a podcast, mate. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Cheers, man. <laughs> <laughs>